and they like, then they will can continue to read. So I would advise you to uh, do that. Now, here I've given four uh, sample uh, sentences that you can use in starting off the sentences in your introduction. You can choose one of these four. There are other sentences. I could give you a whole list of them, but that's not going to be very appropriate because we only have 40 minutes um, and uh, not a long time. Uh, you can use these. I'm giving them as an example, but not to take them and use them exactly as they are, but to take them, you can play around with them. You can change the certain words. That's what um, writing is. You use the sentence, you take it, and then you play around with it to suit your study. Otherwise, we'd have uh, studies being written in the same form everywhere. We don't want that. The words you choose has to suit your subject, um, the form of your paper. It has to, it's all related to your study and your aims. Now, if we were to read the uh, example sentences, for example, as such and such is fundamental to so and so. Now, when we form this sentence, at the beginning, we're actually uh, writing the topic of your uh, study. And then you're saying uh, what it is fundamental to. And the second one, uh, such and such, is fast becoming a key instrument in so and so. Or such and such can play an important role in addressing the issue of so and so. Or the last sentence, such and such is at the heart of our understanding of so and so. Now you're probably thinking, why am I reading out these sentences? Because you can all read these sentences out loud. You can even find examples. But the reason I'm reading them out aloud is so that you can all learn and see how these words are supposed to be pronounced. Because we have five workshops and 40 minutes each. Uh, I'd love to go into more detail, but we don't have much time. So by reading these out, I'm actually giving you the information of how they are pronounced. Um, and I'm going to give these slides to you as well, just like the uh, slides in my first workshop. When you see these, take them and play around with these structures. OK, that would be one of my biggest advices. Now, the aim of the study is very important. But the aim of this study isn't why you're writing the study, because this could be a, uh, a term project. Your aim isn't to score high grades from that class. No, no, we're not going to give this information. The aim we want here is why you're studying this certain subject. That's the aim we want, not why you're writing uh, a term essay. A few examples here would be, this paper attempts to show that so-and-so. In this essay, I attempt to defend the view that so-and-so. The purpose of this paper is to review recent research into the such and such. This paper describes the design and implementation of so and so. Again, you can take these sample sentences, try to play around with them. That's what I want you to do. Today, once this workshop is over, or tomorrow, whenever you have time, until the next workshop, play around with these sentences. Try to make form effective sentences but different to these. These are just the structures that I've given to you. Now, in your study, stating problems is very important. If you have um, imperfect data, for example, you have to put this across uh, so that, you have to put this across so that people understand, the reader understands what the problem is. You have to state every single problem you are facing so that the reader knows why you are doing what you're doing. The examples, for example, the difference between expected and obtained results may be due to incorrect calibration of the instruments. This discrepancy can be attributed to the small sample size of such and such, the anomaly in the observations, so and so, the lack of statistical significance, such and such, the difficulty in dating this archaeological site can probably be according, uh, sorry, can uh, 
probably be accounted for by so and so is probably a consequence of such and such such and such would seem to stem from a defect in the camera so and so weaknesses in the experimental design so and so limited the amount of organic material available now these again are just sample sentences that you can use here you can see the structures as you can see all of the structures all of the words used are formal Formal is very important in academic studies. You have to stick to the formal structure. You have to try and use formal words in portraying your study because it makes it more effective. You have to be formal. Again, look into these sentences after the workshop or whenever you can in this week. Try to play around. Try to use other words instead of these. Now, Preposition, preposition of time. Something that I've come across with many of my students or uh, when I go around look, uh, looking on social media, I see people using these prepositions wrong. In spoken English, yes. In general English, yes. In uh, social media, yes, you can make these mistakes. Nobody's going to turn around and ask you why you haven't used them properly. But if you're writing an academic essay, you have to be very, very careful. You have to know which preposition to use in which structure, in which uh, terms you have to use, because that's actually going to bring down your study. You want an effective piece of work in your hand. When somebody reads it, you want this person to think that you know it all. And to do that, you have to use them properly. Now, these are the example uses of some uh, of the prepositions uh, in time. From 1982 to 1985. Now, when we're pro uh, pronouncing the dates from up to 2000, we say 1982, 1985. After 2000, it will be 2001, 2002. But then when we come to the 2010s, we say 2010, 2011, 2012. So that's just a little tip on how uh, to pronounce the words. Sorry, the number, the dates. I'm so sorry. Now, um, our second sentence is during the first four years, the pass rates rose. The pass rates fluctuate, fluctuated from 1982 to 1994. The pass rate fluctuated throughout the period. The pass rate remained under 50% from 1986 to 1991. As you can see, if we're given two dates, we must use the two in between. And from and in are very, very important, seriously. Um, where was I? The pass rate remained under 50% from 1986 to 1991. The pass rate remained under 50% until 1991. The highest pass rate occurred in 1985 the highest pass rate occurred nine years ago using these prepositions are very important if you want to learn them look at examples again try to read academic articles because academic article articles are seriously going to give you the information that you need when you're writing an article they've already been written and my advice would be to uh, especially uh, read into those that have SSCI indexes or important indexes because you know that they are very uh, written properly. You have this information. They are articles you can trust. So open them up. Look at the structures they're using. Try to find similar structures that are appropriate for you. That is a way out. Now, uh, just a few tips I wanted to give again. Why am I giving this information? Because I have come across people um, using some, uh, for example, prepositions or the as clauses, they can't use it properly. Now I'm going to start with the as clause, but the thing I have to say here is the structure of the sentence can change the meaning of the sentence. There's a very close line. For example, sentence A, as it has been proved, 
this theory may have practical importance in B. As has been proved, the theory may have practical importance. Now, two sentences, and the only difference is in sentence A, we have it. In sentence two, we don't. You probably think they're mostly the same. The meaning isn't going to be very different. So sorry, I've been giving lessons all morning, got sore throat. The meanings aren't the same. When we look at sentence B, we can see that the sentence is just announcing a piece of information. It's confirming something, but it does not have a strong meaning. But when we look at sentence A, the only thing that has been done to the as clause is they've added it. What does it do? It changes the um, sentence, it turns it into a clausal, a causal relationship. It causes, it portrays a causal relationship between the first and the second clause. So it's giving us cause information. Now that's effective. That's the kind of information you want to use. That's the kind of structure you want to use in your academic papers, because that's has a stronger meaning, that has a more effective meaning than sentence B. So usually you think it's, it's not going to make much of a difference, but it does. That's why when you're forming your sentences, when you're forming the structures that you're using in your study, you have to be very careful because you have a certain amount of words that you can use. 3,000, 5,000, I don't know, it depends on uh, what kind of study it is. You have a limitation of words, so you have to use effective structures to give effective information so that you can have an effective study. And when the reader reads it, they're going to understand everything you want to put across. This is very important. Now, prepositions, like I've said before, I have come across people misusing these preposition, prepositions. Again, on social media or somewhere else, it's not a problem. You can misuse these in spoken English, it's not going to be much of a problem, but in an academic uh, in an academic setting, I'm afraid it's not going to be possible. You have to be careful. They may look like minor details, but they are not minor details, I'm afraid. Uh, I've just given four examples. Again, after the workshop, within this week, you're going to get the, these slides. What I want you to do is take these slides, look at my examples, try to find other examples. I'm giving you, because I don't have much time, I'm giving you little pieces of information that you can um, be aware of. There is this rule, there is this situation, I have to be careful there. But how are you going to be careful? In your own time, outside of the workshop, you have to do your own research. Look at the prepositions, search it out, find out for yourself, do your own research and find the information for yourself. I'm just trying to attract your attention. I'm trying to say there is such a problem, be aware, be careful, but learning what these are, learning the proper rules is up to you. Um, the first sentence, example sentence is, as shown in table one, the second, as can be seen from the data in table five, as shown by the data in table six, as described on page 12. Now, prepositions are very important. Be careful when you're using them. That clause. Now, that clause, in uh, academic English is mainly used with reporting verbs. And, or should I say, re reporting verbs are followed with the that clause. Again, what we're looking here is at the meaning, at the effect of the words that we are using. Because, Using the right word in academic English is very important. If you use the right word, you will have a stronger case, okay? Putting across a stronger case in academics is very, very important. 
because you're spending time on putting something across, giving information, make it strong. Using the right language, using the right uh, flow, using the right structure, using the right word is very, very important. Now, um, that clause does have a variety of functions, yes. But I'm, again, I'm just going to give a little information because we don't have much time. Sorry, today I'm uh, constantly going on about not having much time, uh, but I've actually given you guys a bombardment of um, information in this workshop, I'm very sorry. Now, when we look at the first example, in her article, Marcia Barinaga says there is a difference in the way men and women pursue scientific research. Now, what can we say about this sentence? Unfortunately, the word says, that's a lot less formal than the other two verbs used. So my personal advice to you guys, do not form or do not use this structure. Do not use says in your articles or in your studies. That's a lot less formal. We are trying to stay away from less formal. In academic English, we need to be formal. So get rid of says, okay? We're not using says again. Now the other two examples, Marcia Baranaga in her article, is there a female style in science, states that men and women are indeed different. Now the use of states, what information is that giving us? It's telling us that Baranaga has given a lot of detail in her article. And we're saying that she has information, she has data to support her idea, to support her message. Now that's very strong. States is a very strong verb to use. And I would say if the article has given, uh, su has supported their message, does have data, has given detail, then this is definitely the verb you should use. Now the third example, Marcia Baranaga in her article, is there a female style in silent science, mentions that men and women exhibit differences in the way they pursue science. Mentions, now what does mentions mean? It's telling us that she's written an article, yes, she spent time, but she's just slightly going into this area. She hasn't given detail, and she hasn't supported this idea. She doesn't have data on this idea. So as you can see, the second sentence, the one with states, is much stronger and much more effective than mentions. So unless Barinaga seriously just mentioned it, do not use mentions. Now use the use of the proper, sorry, I wouldn't say proper, that would be wrong. Uh, the use of the correct uh, or effective word, verb, in a sentence is very important because every sentence is a piece of information that you're giving to the reader. And every sentence has much importance for you because you have a limited amount of words to put across your study. You have limited space and you want to give across the information effectively. When somebody reads it, you want them to say, yes, that's it, I understand. Yes, she's correct or he's correct. Effectiveness is very important in academic English. So when you're writing, when you're using verbs, use them very, uh, be very delicate, okay? Think about the verb you're using, think about how effective it is and the meaning that lays behind it. Because the meaning behind the verb makes your sentence much stronger or weaker. We don't want weak sentences unless we have to use them. Because having said, uh, yes, we want strong sentences, but if there are sentences that we have to be weak, then keep weak. Be weak, keep them weak. You can't strengthen out all of them. Now, uh, another area of uh, academic English is giving definitions. Now, if I'm uh, studying something that hasn't been studied before, 
if I'm producing or creating a term specific to my study, then I have to give the definition. Or um, sometimes you may prefer to give, even if it's known, you may prefer to give a definition of the term that you are using because maybe the readers don't know your area. Maybe you want everyone to understand uh, the study you're putting across, the terms you're using. Now, these are a few examples of how you can uh, give definitions. Again, I'm so sorry, I'm constantly drinking tea. My throat, been talking too much this morning. The first sentence, a sole proprietorship is a business. Now, our term is sole proprietorship, and then we're explaining what this is. We're defining the term, annealing the term. Annealing is a metalworking process, and the sentence con continues. A star is a celestial body, blah, de, blah, de, blah. Writing is a social cognitive process. Def you will see many definitions in uh, written articles. You will come across them. They are very important. You must know how to put across definitions. Give the term first and then give the information and then describe what it is. Now, I've given two examples. As you can see in the first sentences, we're using the articles A and we use them before the uh, term and when describing them. Now, in the first sentence, sentence A, a disinfectant is an agent capable of destroying disease causing microorganisms. B, a disinfectant is the agent capable of destroying disease causing microorganisms. Now you, you may think, what difference is it going to make? But in uh, definitions, it makes a lot of uh, it makes a lot of a difference. Seriously, using and and using the in a what it's doing. If we're using uh, in a when we say is an agent, what it's doing is it's actually just classifying the term. It's actually classifies the term disinfectant. It hasn't defined it. It hasn't given detail as to what it is. It isn't, well, it's not actually a definition. It's just a classification. But when we look at sentence B, what do we see? The use of the article the. What it's doing is it's identifying, is describing the term. If we want to give a definition of something, I would advise you to use the, but when defining something, you don't want to give the details. You don't want to identify or describe what the term is. You just want to give the classification, then you use the article A. Your choice of articles, your choice of prepositions, your choice of verbs is very important. Now I can hear some people uh, some of the students among you say, yes, but how do we know where to use them? Okay, that's difficult because you have to know English. B1 or B2, I would advise, you have to know English, you have to learn the meanings of these words. You have to know how they can change the meaning. One way I would say, is to do a lot of reading. Seriously, reading is definitely going to help you guys out in learning new words and in um, seeing new structures. You're going to see certain words or verbs that you've never used before being used with different meanings. Reading is seriously going to give you a much greater inventory. Now, I've actually given three uh, articles that I want to go on. Um, why? Because we have to see these articles. I am going to have, our friends are going to send you all these articles. I want you all to read them, okay? I tried to make sure that they were slightly simple because I want you to be aware of the structures that have been used. Now, reading articles, you can sometimes see very interesting and very effective uh, structures 
if you see structures that are very effective and you think this is the kind of sentence I want to form, this is the kind of structure I want, copy it, paste it into your Word file and have a long list of these structures. Because if you have a structure in hand, no matter, even if it's not uh, related to your topic, all you have to do is take this structure and relate it to yours. You can change it around, you can play with it, as long as you keep the structure the same. So this is something I would seriously advise you all to do. If you are writing an academic article or a presentation or a thesis, whatever it is, look at other articles, not only those in your own study area, but in other study areas, because these structures will give you clues on how to use uh, certain verbs, certain uh, words, these are going to be very effective. Now, when we look at articles at a general perspective, we see two uh, different types, review articles and uh, research articles. Now, review articles are actually articles that are summarizing uh, past studies. We have primary sources that have been done. What this author is, the author is doing is taking them summarizing them or maybe it's giving us a current situation of a research or it's putting across how the um, different authors different researchers have put different information maybe it's going to give a collective view of the subject so what these studies do is they uh, look at the studies that have been carried out in literature now as you can see, I'm going to, I'm not actually going to go into detail. You'll see these um, highlighted sections in the papers that you're going to receive because I've highlighted them before I sent them uh, to you guys. You can see certain um, uses, certain structures. For example, um, in the first one, you can see that it, how they are putting across the importance of this article. You can see how they're giving reason, you can see uh, the information they're giving, you can actually see how they're referring. Referring to a source is very important, especially in reviews, because in a review article, you're constantly referring to other studies. Do not refer to every study that comes along your way. Choose those that have been cited more that have more citations, because if a lot of people have cited a certain study, then you can be sure that that study has quality. And it's a study that you can use, that you can refer to, that you can add into your study. But the amount of references you have does not actually mean that you have a great study or that you've written a great article. The important thing is that you have the relevant the relevant references. If it's relevant, use it. If it isn't, then it's uh, too much baggage. You don't need that. Now here, uh, how you structure reviews are, you first give the information like you saw in, the, uh, in this slide. You're giving information about what the subject is, why, why the importance of your study. This is the information you're giving. And then, you have a subject, you have to branch it out, you have to structure it out. As you can see in this study, they've um, used their own structure, they've gone into, because it's geographical, uh, they're going into certain areas. What you're doing is you have a subject, you're structuring it out, and you're filling it up. And in the end, you're giving a conclusion. Now, uh, a research article, I'm just going to give a recap, uh, try to be very quick. A research article is an original study. A researcher has a certain topic that has not been studied before. Uh, well, for example, metaphors have been studied by many people. I study metaphor as well in Turkish sign language. But metaphor is a very big area. So I'm choosing a certain point that has not been studied in Turkish sign language before because if it has been carried out with, by somebody else and I can't add something else to it, then I'm just going to be repeating them. I'm just copying them. It's no good. 
Okay, if I have information that's going to enhance the previous study, do it. If not, stay clear. Now, uh, the structures of research articles are different to those of re review articles, because here again, you're um, going to refer to previous studies. You have to, because these studies, this information you're giving is the base of your study. You have to put across why people have studied what they have said about this subject. Once you fill in the base, the fundamental area, and think of it like a cake. You have the base of the cake. The introduction is the base. How strong it is, the better it's going to be. The firmer it's going to be, and it's not going to crack up very easily. Now, um, in this article, you can see that it's actually given information to what they are studying, the question they want to answer, but they haven't really set out different questions, as in question one, question two, question three. You can do this. You don't have to openly give these study questions. You don't have to say my study questions are as follows, question one, question two. You don't have to do that. You can do like this as well. There are many different structures many different layouts that you can use in academic uh, articles, academic studies. It's up to you how you wish to use them. Now, the second highlight, the purchase was a tiger pounce. Now, a thing I wanted to say, just to give a small tip, um, when we're giving way for expressions in our articles, we can use these hyphens or we can use italic. But the most important thing is, Whatever you're using at the beginning of your study, you have to keep it going throughout the study. If I'm going to put the expressions with italic, I mean, I'm a linguist and my uh, studies are all on language. So I have loads of expressions in my articles. If I start with an italic, I go throughout to the end as italic, but I don't have some of them italic, some of them with hyphens. Like I said in the last workshop, the style, the flow of your study is very, very important. Now, again, I'm not going to go into this. You guys are all going to have these um, articles, three articles. I wanted to give way to this third article. As you can see at the bottom, what they've done here is they have actually given you information of what they're studying and they've openly given the questions as one, two, three. They have given you the questions uh, that they want to answer in their study. Why is questions important? Because just like brains, just like I said in workshop one, your study needs a question. You have a question, you go down, you give the information, you give the base, you give your findings, and in the conclusion, which we're going to do in the fourth um, uh, workshop, you have to answer them correctly. Your study questions are very important. Because if your study questions and your answers in your conclusion are different, then I'm afraid that's a no-no. Because there has to be a link. The, just like the aim of your study, your study questions, the problems you're trying to solve are very important because in the conclusion, you have to solve them. You have to answer them. But if you're answering another question, that's going to be a problem. Okay, I've spoken too much again. Um, just want to say I've given a few links last lesson, uh, last workshop, sorry. I said I was going to give you guys a few links to watch um, articles or seminars. I have a link there of a channel which I thought was very good. It has lectures, uh, subjects and it has seminars. You may want to look into them, just watch them, may be effective. And I have, uh, I can't remember which one they were, but I actually have given um, a link on verbs and a vocabulary, article vocabulary, academic English vocabulary. Look into them. You can see the lists of the words that you can use and try to use them in your own studies. I've also given a link of the English corpora. Now, why is this important? Because corporas are actually database of language. If you have the words, if you see how they're used, in what structures they're used, that gives you information on how you should use them. 
Okay, now going about using these links would be very effective for you. Like I said, I'm going to send the slides. You'll be able to get your information there. Check these links out, okay? And lastly, last uh, workshop, I said I was going to give a list of films and shows. Uh, on the left, you can see the shows and series, Friends, Big Bang Theory, Grey's Anatomy, Desperate Housewives, Sherlock, one of my favorites, and The Good Place. You want academic English, but you have to fulfill yourself in general English, okay? If your general English is very good, then your academic English is going to be just as good, okay? Because general English, your information, your knowledge of English uh, affects your use of English. And how better you are, the better you will be in academic English. So. If you want to be brilliant at writing academic English, just reading articles, just reading scientific papers is not enough because that's only going to give you the information of the terms, but you want to know how to use the language. You have to know general English, you have to know the structure of the language, and then you can go into improving yourself um, in academic English. Now, the the middle row is of documentaries and they're all of uh, Sir David Attenborough, one of my favourites. I do love uh, watching him. The reason I gave a list of his documentaries is because uh, Attenborough's use of language, the way how he pronounces the words, the way how he speaks slowly, his tonation is seriously good and he doesn't speak fast. So that's not really going to be a problem. You're going to be able to uh, understand most of what's being said. And I have a few uh, films as well that you may want to watch, but don't just stick to these. The most important thing is that you watch the films, the documentaries, the series that interest you, because we don't want you to be getting bored when you're watching them. If you enjoy yourself, then you're going to learn the words. But if you're getting bored, then seriously, the two hours or the three hours you spend in front of the TV getting bored is going to be so ineffective. You're not going to learn anything. Okay, I've spoken a lot again. Thank you very much. I think we can end it here. Ma'am, um, before the question part, we must take the roll call. There will be a box okay. in your screen and you must click yes button. After the roll call, everyone could ask questions. Thank you. While we're waiting for everyone to uh, answer the polls, there was a few questions that I couldn't answer last um, workshop. Maybe I can start answering them just very shortly. Um, someone asked if they should be listening to political conference. My answer would be yes, try it if it's in your interest. If you like politics, yes, listen to them. You're not going to lose anything, but there's no thing no such thing as if you listen to political uh, conferences, if you listen to academic conferences, your academic English is going to be great, great, no. Try to listen to every genre. Try watching every sort of film. When you're reading books, try to read all sorts of novels. Just reading academic papers is not enough. Reading stories, reading novels, they're good. Seriously, you need as much information as you can get. So try to keep the variety very large. Subtitles, yes, someone asked me about subtitles uh, last workshop. 
my advice would be now I can give you techniques as a teacher. I know the techniques that could be used. But the thing is, every person is different to themselves. Okay? The technique suitable for everybody in learning a language is different. The way I learn is different to me than the way you learn is going to be different. So you have to try them out. I'd say use English subtitles only if you have some English, if you understand more or less. Uh, what's being said using these subtitles for say a month see how it's going and if you really feel that you're starting to understand what is being said then you you should leave these subtitles as for the use of Turkish and English subtitles at the same time personally I wouldn't really advise it because um, that may actually confuse you but I've heard that it's very effective for some people so um, Try it out. If it's effective for you, use that technique. If it's not, then don't go for it. But when I say try it out, I don't mean just for a week. You have to give yourself a month or maybe six to seven weeks. That would be enough. Okay, that's all the questions. Oh, and um, I'm supposed to be giving you all homework. So while we're waiting, um, I want to give you guys your homework. Just give a little information. I want you all to write an introduction, okay? But I want it to be a review. The topic is totally up to you. It could be cinema, it could be arts, it could be a scientific uh, subject. It's totally up to you, okay? Uh, what's important is I want to see the use of your language. I want to see you all using formal English, okay? Uh, five pages at least, uh, but I'll accept four. Um, I want to see these pages. Uh, why? Because I'm going to, hopefully, uh, when I get the time, I would like to look into them and I would like to give feedbacks. So once I get your uh, short introductions on your subject, I'm going to uh, check them out, see where you, you've done mistakes and how can you improve. I'm going to give this information back to you. So if you can do this homework, I'd be very, very happy. And I think uh, if you do these homework, you're going to actually get certificates. in the latter part of 19th century. You can, you can, but it's more of an, um, a literature style. This use, this uh, structure is more literature, but it can be used in academic writing. You're very welcome. Oh, thank you very much, Adam. I'm glad uh, you are very pleased. And Marve, thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Five pages too much. Um, okay, let's say three pages, but please do do it because I'm going to give you feedback and I'm going to tell you where your mistakes are. So um, it may take your time, but I have to say seriously, the feedback you're going to get is going to be very effective for you and it will help you out in your uh, academic careers or your academic English. So please do try to do the homework. Yes, yes, Sajan, I totally agree, yes. Giraj. Ah, the introduction, what I've done is we have five workshops. In the first one, I gave you guys an introduction to what academic English was, what you have to uh, take into consideration. And in the next three uh, workshops, what I'm doing is I've actually split up the uh, articles so that I can go into every uh, section and give you detail on how you should do it. And in the fifth uh, workshop, I'm going to actually tell you guys how to present it 
Okay, we're going to wrap it all up, give you some extra information, and we're going to go into a little pronunciation. Um, just the homework, I want three pages. Usually, uh, depending on your study, for example, my thesis, I have 30 pages of um, introduction because that's where you give your references. Uh, that's the base of your study. It can change. Sometimes it can be uh, depending on how long your article is. It could be two pages. It could be three pages. It could be 10 pages. It depends on your uh, study totally. Of course you can, of course you can. That would be great. At least I'd be able to help you out. Oh, that's brilliant. Seriously, if you're writing an article, you can just write three pages, three to five pages. I'd prefer five, but um, if you don't have time, I'll accept three. At least you'll um, have the chance to write it and it'll give you, I'll help you uh, give direction to your studies. Uh, I don't know about the deadline, but I think Zehra, uh, Miss Chum, I, sorry, I died there, Chum, I think, I can't remember your name, I'm so sorry, Miss Chum. Yes, I am um, I'm so sorry, no uh, problem. I'm terrible with names, seriously. I think she's going to give a deadline. Um, is one week enough? Can I choose when the deadline is? Yes. Okay, yes. great. <laughs> then you all have until um, the fifth workshop. Okay, at the end of the fifth workshop, which gives you, you actually have four weeks. I think, no, you don't have four weeks. You have three weeks. Um, at the end of the last workshop, I want your homework soon. Yes, we've just answered the deadline. Yes, we've answered that again. You're very welcome, Yaj. Thank you very much, Beza. You're very welcome, Melissa. Ah, okay. To improve that, if you're good with daily words, I would advise you to write a paragraph okay, using daily language, okay, using daily words, informal, more like informal words, write a paragraph, okay, and then set aside to write a second paragraph. But in the second paragraph, look for the informal words to use in their place, okay. Trying out constantly, uh, practicing writing is the best way you can improve yourselves. Thank you very much, Estra. Oh, and um, for informal words, again, like I said before, read articles, okay, not to understand them, but read articles to see the words they use, okay, to see the structures they're using. Copy from them. I mean, take the structure, take the word, change it to your subject, okay? You can play around with them. It's brilliant. Okay, I think about the homework, we can actually send messages so that we don't miss out. Um, the homework is to write an introduction. The subject is totally up to you. It can be scientific, it can be um, of the arts, anything you like. Uh, I had said five, but I will accept three. Uh, I just want an introduction using academic English. Once you write this uh, homework, you have to send it to me or send it uh, to us by the uh, last workshop. And then I'm going to look at them, correct them and give you all feedback. OK, I think that's all. Do we have, have I missed any questions? OK, I think that's all. Oh, thank you very much. I love you all very much too. Awesome. You're very welcome, Phuket. Oh, thank you very much. I love you all very much too. 
No, there's not a specific topic. I want you all to write about something you enjoy or maybe something that you're very curious about because um, homeworks are usually very difficult and very boring and people don't like doing them. I want you to enjoy writing this, okay? I want this to be a good experience for you all because when you write these, I'm going to give feedback and I'm going to tell you how you can correct them, which is going to be great. Oh, you're very welcome, Ms. Yasin. I'm glad you enjoy them. <laughs> Find them funny. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yasin. Seriously, it was great seeing you at the beginning, my dear friend. You're welcome. I'd like to thank you all for attending. Thank you very much. You're very welcome, Izzy. Thank you for joining. Well, thank you very much, Gokto. Um, seriously, I'm very honoured and very happy that you think so. Thank you very, very much. I'm glad that I've been able to get across to you all and that you had fun because academic English can be a little boring, but um, it's better to have fun when you're doing it. You're very welcome, Alia. You're very welcome, Stella. Um, Hassan, yes, um, it is acceptable in academic English, but because uh, using I and we, the um, active in Turkish, yes, it's um, not acceptable. In English, we're not as strict, but we would prefer to not use I. We would prefer it in academic English, um, but there are still some researchers that prefer to use I. They prefer a more active approach. Uh, but again, it's preferred not to use the active form, but if you do, it's not really a problem like it is in Turkish. Turkish is much more strict. <laughs> okay, that, that's a, an interesting uh, point of view. Marva, but acceptable, I guess. Ah, uh, my advice would be don't get into translation, um, Esra, because if you go into translating, you're not actually learning the word. You're not learning English. If you want to learn English, if you want to be an effective writer in English, then you have to be better at English. And to do that, I would advise you to write in English. But if you're writing in Turkish, then you're, not, you're always going to be an ineffective writer in English. And translating is going to take up much more of your time because you're going to spend, say, uh, weeks on writing an article in Turkish, and then you're going to spend much more time translating it into English. And when you translate from Turkish to English, if you're not a translator, uh, because translating, I'm also, uh, I spent 10 years translating, um, you have to be a good translator to form an effective text. But if you're not forming an effective text in the English version, then your writing isn't going to be effective. So my advice would be, do not translate from Turkish to English. Try to write in English firstly. And to improve your writing, spend, say, uh, an hour every day trying to write something. The more you write, 
seriously, the better you will be. I mean, <clears throat> in university in Turkey, um, when I first came to Turkey, uh, my Turkish, especially, I've never had Turkish education in England or in Turkey, but at university, this was a very big problem for me. Writing Turkish, seriously, I cannot explain how difficult it is. Uh, if you were to see my written work when I first came, it's terrible. Now, it's not perfect, but I'm getting there. It is much better. So my advice would be write as much as you can. Whenever you get the chance, sit down and try to write something. <laughs> uh, you would love to see it, but uh, to be honest, you wouldn't understand anything because back then uh, it was very, it wasn't good at all. But maybe one day I'll share it. I don't know. Yes, uh, if yes. you want, I can end the meeting. Of course, uh, if there are no questions, we can end it. Thank okay, you. then. Hi, you're very welcome. I'm just glad I've been able to answer your questions. Thank you all for attending. Seriously, it was a pleasure for me.